Hey folks, this is Matt once again, and this time, there we go, I'm um, taking a look at probably my favorite of the Hellraiser series, not even probably, this is my favorite, Hellbound Hellraiser 2, I know there's a special edition, but I didn't know if it was worth getting, because this does have a commentary with Tony Randall, Ashley Lawrence, and Peter, Peter Atkins, um, does have about 15-20 minute featurette on the film, trailer, so, didn't know if the special edition was really that much worth getting. But, I think this one's my favorite because it was the first one I saw. It kind of worked as a standalone because in the opening you get a flashback to the original film. But, um, for, well, first off, it has a flashback to uh, Dud Bradley, of course, who played Pinhead, when he was human and how he turned into Pinhead. But then again, you have a little flashback to the original film, kind of the, the best of the ending of the first Hellraiser, which I remember seeing as a kid. Oh, cool. You know, that's a cool way to open because I didn't know about the first one. Well, obviously I knew about it, but because it's a two. But I had not seen it for a long time after seeing the, the second one. But I was not confused. Like, they had enough. I'm like, okay, I'm up to speed. And you have Ashley Lawrence coming back. I think because she was in a two-picture deal. And that's the thing. This commentary is not really the best commentary because Ashley Lawrence doesn't say much. And Tony Randall kind of picks apart some parts of the film. Um, it seems like the only people who really don't mind this film is like Clive Barker. I don't think he minds the film. He thinks it's a better sequel than what most sequels happen to be. So I like that. But I think Ashley Lawrence and... The director, like the director, keeps talking about how he wishes he could remake the film now that he's learned so much. But I don't find that much wrong with this film. I really don't. It's definitely my favorite. I said probably, but you know, Hellraiser the first one is a classic. But I love this one. But anyway, as she Lawrence comes back as Kirsty. Now she's in a psychiatric hospital. Her boyfriend from the first film, they sent him home, <laughs> so you, you never see him again. But I think just. I think I heard in the features of the first film. I think the actor wasn't really happy working on the first film. Because his character really doesn't get to do much. He's not the hero. He doesn't get to save the girl. He doesn't get to really do anything. So, <clears throat> But it is weird that, you know, the boyfriend would just send home and never hear from him again. <laughs> He's like, fuck this. Yawn, yawn, Kirsty. Fuck you. Keep away from me. You and your shit. I'm on. <laughs> I don't find some nice girl who, you know, all I have to worry about is whether she has STDs or not. You and your demon shit, you just keep it to yourself. <laughs> That's how you can maybe look at it. But anyway, she's looked at like this homicide cop and you know, the detectives giving her the third degree because they find um, the shit that was on her place she was at. Uh, one of them leads to another, and you have some doctors looking at her. You have a Dr. Channard, Dr. Channard, uh, played by Kenneth Cranham. He's sort of the human bad guy of this film. Um, you also have uh, his assistant, William Hope, from Aliens in here. Um, one thing leads to another, and you have the bloody mattress from the first film that the stepmom, Julia, had been killed. One thing leads to another. We find out that the doctor, uh, Doctor Channard, he's really you know fucked up. His psychiatric hospital, like this is before Signs of Lambs and shit. I mean, it's really a fucked up hospital and inmates. It was really creepy atmosphere. Even when a kid, when I was a, saw this as a kid, and he's really into the the bots and stuff like that. So he hears her story and thinks that maybe she's telling the truth and wants to know more about it so she gets that bloody mattress because Kirstie's like burn it burn it you know don't let her blood kind of like in the first film the blood will help bring it back and he gets this guy who's uh <clears throat> crazy puts him on the bed and he gets killed by Julia skinless really graphic scene you know bloody as hell you know bloody skinless body killing this guy and Julia's come back, and she wraps herself. Well, he wraps her in these bandages. And I don't know what the fuck this doctor is doing. 
because Dr. Chan, like, for some reason falls in love with Julia. I'm like, she's got no skin, okay? Maybe if she has a little fat, okay. She has a little bit of hair, okay. Anywhere, okay. Armpits, down there, up above, hair, no hair, okay. Titties a small bit, okay. Skin is a necessary. You need skin, otherwise, no, okay. No one is going to be, oh, wow, she has no skin. That's hot. You know, skinless is like a, a necessity for a female. That and legal and alive and between the age of 18 and 70. You know, I mean, come on, skinless? Really? You don't know? Oh, wow, this skinless girl is hot. I just never understood that. What the hell is Dr. Chan guy? But I guess that's supposed to be the whole... Hellraiser, they sort of deal with taboo and, you know, trying to push the envelope and such. Um, he also introduces a young girl who's there who doesn't speak. She has a knack for solving puzzles named Tiffany. And the actress's name is Emodian Borman. <clears throat> I guess she gave up acting in 1993. And she actually is now an accomplished and training judo and started to train jujitsu. She went on to make a prosperous career in jujitsu competitions. So wow, Tiffany, you bring her brain hellraiser, you probably you know for a pin. Wow, jujitsu, okay. She didn't act much. She acted in another film before this called Dream Child and then T V then again retired in eighteen ninety three. That's too bad. She did a good job. I mean, playing someone who can't talk sounds easy, but I'm sure it is easy, but she involves a lot of emotion. I really care for this Tiffany girl. I think what I like about this film, it kind of reminds me a little bit of how alien to aliens Hellraiser 1 to Hellraiser 2 is for me. Because uh, Hellraiser 2, Hellbound, pushed it more, was bigger, because here they actually go into hell, or the labyrinth, if you want to call it that. And um, you have Kirsty Ashley Lawrence. She has to protect a younger person. Tiffany, kind of like how Ripley has to protect Newt. So I like that vibe. Um, this Tiffany girl, Emodium Borman, I thought she did a good job. And Kirsty, her whole thing is she sees this bloody message saying, I am in hell, help me. And she thinks it's her dad suffering, so she wants to... Andrew Robinson decided not to come back because he would have, but they wouldn't pay him the money he wanted, and plus he didn't like the script, so he didn't come back. Which I know they complain about in the commentary, the whole deal with her finding her dad leads to nowhere, but I I disagree. Because the whole thing is, the, the doctor, Shannon, he's, you know, using his patience to have Julia get her skin back, and uh, William Hope now s sees this one time and believes Ashley Lawrence, and she needs the box because she wants to help her dad, get her ba dad back. Okay, she has a motivation. One of these from another, William Hope is killed by Julia. And the Cenobites, the doctor and Julia, mainly the doctor, he wants to see how it all works. So he gives the box to the Tiffany girl to open it. Pinhead and them come in and they realize, no, <clears throat> someone else is the reason why. The doctor and Julia go in, and Percy goes in to help find her dad. Um, Tiffany, she doesn't know what, so she wanders in. <clears throat> and then the second half of the film is basically in this labyrinth where Kirsty finds out that that was actually Uncle Frank fooling her to believing that her dad was there. And they're like, well, no. but I don't understand the people in this commentary, the directors. I like the fact that it made sense. A, why would Andrew Robinson's care to be in hell? He didn't open the box. He wasn't evil. There's no reason he should be in hell. Kirsty doesn't know that. I mean, like, she believes it and just easily believes because she's all fucked up. But it makes sense he wouldn't be in hell. And second off, of course, Uncle Frank from the first one would want to fool her. Because he's, you know, evil. He's pissed off that she um, fucked him up in the first movie. So, you know, he wants to 
you know, wants revenge in a way. So it made sense to me, so I don't understand that. And she fights Frank and Uncle Frank and gets with Tiffany and they stop Julia. A scene where um, they grab onto her and she they're being sucked and Julia's skin gets pulled off her body and sent to oblivion. Um, by this time, the doctor, Julia, has put him in this thing and you see him become this pretty badass uh, Cenobite who they just this thing attached to him. He's like, the doctor is in. And Kirsty and Tiffany tried to escape. They go back to the hospital, but the portal's still open. <clears throat> and so he comes in and he sees all these patients and just fucks them all up. You don't see a lot of it because they probably didn't have the budget for it, but um, you see one guy get fucked up and he's a badass and everybody has all these knives and shit attached to him and little knives attached to, like these vein like well like tendo type things they go back into hell and you have the scene where she found this photograph of Doug Bradley when he was human and shows him that you guys used to be human you were now always demons and then you get to the scene that pisses a lot of people off where but this guy, this Chandler guy, he comes in and kills the Cenobites very easily. Well, on one hand, I understand. On the other, to me, I, you know, now that I see the first, the, the third film, it's the fact that he was weakened by Kirsty. Kirsty weakened by showing that hey, he used to be human. So it weakened their... That's how I bought into it. I think because Pinhead's pretty badass in the third one, that it didn't bother me. But I understand what people were saying, because those Cenobites get killed pretty easily, and this Pinhead sort of gets turned to a human, tries to help Kirsty, and he gets killed very easily, granted. But now he's been sort of human. And granted, it's like, how do you get killed in hell? You can't. So how is it you get killed in hell because it's hell, you know, and they're already dead, but I guess it's supposed to be more of a spiritual weakening or something. And at least they don't ignore that in the third film. In the third film, they explain that and Pinhead, after he's been sort of turned to human and killed, he's been split apart, and I'll get to that in the third. At least they don't say it never happened. I appreciate that. But I just liked the visual way they did Hell. It wasn't fire and brimstone. It was sort of gothic and the, the corridors. I liked the map paintings they used. Um, the doors definitely there. Um, I liked the characters. I liked Percy. I liked Tiffany. Um, I love Tiffany's one line where they go in the house and they see Chandler as a Cinnabon and she goes, Oh, shit. <laughs> That always made me laugh. And I enjoyed the ending where um, beforehand Tiffany, like you get some really creepy images. Like Tiffany's like in this carnival type thing and something about her mom. I think her mom was murdered some way or another. Maybe by Dr. Chan or maybe not. Like these weird images. Very creepy images like a, a, a baby toy that's being, her mouth being sewed. Really creepy images. And then later on she sort of comes over that and Decides to solve the puzzle to close the gates. And Percy, you find out she actually put on Julia's skin to fuck with the Channer and Cenobite, give it time so um, Tiffany can solve it. A nice reveal of Kirsty, like, you're like, what the hell is this Julia? Why is she helping? And then tearing the face, and it's Kirsty. And the film ends. I mean, the film was supposed to be the last film, there was supposed to be nothing after this. And yeah, I think, I mean, this came out in 80, I think 1988. And then Hellraiser 3 came out in like 92, something like that, 1992, something like that. So this was supposed to be the end of the series. But, I mean, this film wasn't a big hit. I mean, I guess maybe it was a hit somewhat, but it only made... 14 million dollars no 12 million dollars it says here so it wasn't really a gigantic hit or any hit or hit but i guess you know big enough that you know dimension they finally uh, got the rights and they made hellraiser 3 in 1992 so like four years later but 
I really enjoy this film. I really like this film. I mean, problems, some of the story is kind of like, maybe you could tell that maybe they rushed things a bit. You know, why are the Cenobites taken out easily? I, I can understand that. Um, you, you know, you can't really die in hell, so how come some of these, you know, like, Uncle Frank, he, he's, when he becomes stainless Frank, his heart gets taken out, it's like, he's not really dead, right, he's, it's hell, you know, so you're kind of like, okay, shaky logic, um, but at the same time, it's a Hellraiser moment, what can I say, but I, it's my favorite, because I thought it grows at a fast pace, I like the, that when they go into hell, I like the way hell looked with the corridors, it's dark, it's gothic. Uh, the little bit of Pinhead and his background, I didn't mind at all. I liked Ashley Lawrence and I liked uh, Tiffany. I liked their sort of her one protecting the other. Um, the Goy was there. Um, the Dr. Chandler Cinnabite I thought was really cool looking. Capable direction, it definitely has a a feel of the first film. It definitely has that Clive Barker feel of the first movie, atmosphere-wise. Um, I like the attempt that they tried to go further. It wasn't just a remake of the first film. I mean, overall, I really enjoyed Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. It's always been my favorite of the bunch. Um, and either way, I enjoyed it. I liked it. So, I don't know what more I can say about that, but thanks for watching, and stay tuned for my review of Hellraiser 3 hell on earth. So thanks for watching and take care. Later.